call. Yeah, remember to keep an eye on the lobby and ask, accept anyone waiting there if needed. I hope you can all see the first slide. Yeah, and the recording has started. So if any of you didn't want to be recorded, keep your mouth shut or disconnect now. Okay, so welcome everyone to this new edition of the Uni Community Hours. We have quite a few topics today, so let's get straight to, into the first one, which is about the new release of Uni, which uh, was uh, published, I don't remember anymore, I think it was last Friday or this Monday, <laughs> sorry about it. But anyway, it has a lot of new changes, first of all, and a lot of new operating systems supported as clients. Uh, I will just quickly talk about this because we already discussed it during the last community hour. So Amazon Linux 2, which is based on CentOS 7, Alibaba Linux 2, based on CentOS 7 as well, Alma Linux 8, I don't think it needs a, a presentation anymore, but anyway, it's based on CentOS 8 and Rahel 8. And then Microfocus on the Open Enterprise Server 2018 SP3. And of course, OpenSUSE Leap 15.3 that it is still, it says Vita here, but I'm not sure if it is release candidate already. And other than the new operating systems, there is also there are also changes to the maintenance windows user interface. We have Pascal here, who will talk about them after my presentation. We also enabled the SAM SSL certificate support, meaning that you can now use SSL, SSL certificates with alternate alternative names. Now you can use reactivation keys in the bootstrap scripts, which is useful, for example, if you want to move a client from one proxy to the to the other, to other proxy. Redfish power management, so you are not restricted to IPMI anymore. Open a SCAP for not from SS, well, from SSM or for SSM. So you, you can now use the system set management to launch massive open SCAP scans if you want. We also have changes to the virtualization interface, in this case, the network creation UI. So you will be able to create new virtual networks for LiveVirt with almost all the parameters that you could expect from the console. Of course, we will be adding something more in the future if it is needed. We also added the um, universe security, multiverse, restrict, and backport channels for all the Ubuntu versions we support. As of today, remember that's LT, Ubuntu LTSS, so 1604, 1804, 2004. The Prometheus exporter exporter is available for Debian. Remember that this is, let's say, a virtual exporter that allows you to, expo to, to expose all the other exporters using a single TCP port. And the node exporter was updated to the version 1.1.2. So there are a lot uh, of changes that are not here. You need to check the release notes. All the details are there. And that's about, that's everything about the new version of Uni. So yeah, any questions about it? Okay, then if not, I will give the floor to Pascal who is going to present the changes to the maintenance windows user interface. Okay. Great, I think you can still hear me. I will now try to, to share my screen. Should be upcoming now and you should be able to see my browser. Yes. That's correct. Okay, great. Then let's get started. So um, there was a changes for the maintenance windows UI and the best way um, to actually show you since it's purely UI change is to just give you a big a quick demo about it. So if you were there to maintenance windows and then calendars, then you probably remember if you click on the details from before that you just were presented with this plain ICHI file that wasn't very useful, at least not very human readable. And the same also for the schedules. Um, there you had a listing of the maintenance windows that were upcoming. That was, of course, at least 
partially useful, but all of this has been replaced with what I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to head back to my browser. So let's select the details of one of the calendars that I have prepared just for the demo. And if you scroll down a bit, then you see instead of the iFile file, you see an interactive calendar here where you can, of course, navigate between the individual months, can jump back to the current date, and also um, click on the individual dates to get a timeline overview of what is happening there. So then you might wonder, of course, you can also jump between day and month back and forth again. And you also have the option if there is um, like, let's actually show this this one if the other calendars. Let's go to this one because this one has like some some weeks between in each individual recurrence of the event. So if you go through there, then you will see that there's months, for example, July, where there is no wait hands windows. This is what those double arrows are for because this way, if you use them, you can just quickly skip to the next month that, that has maintenance windows. So it jumps directly from, from June to August and back. The same works if you are in, in the daily overview of a calendar, you can just jump between the individual events here and also go back to the current day, which, which is today. Yes. The same actually works for, for the schedules as well. So if you go here to schedules, then if you remember, if you create, want to create a schedule, um, there's two ways that two types of schedules that we support is single or multi. If you select single here and put in some schedule name, then uh, just add one of the calendars. And then let's look for example, what I made for the single schedule here. And then it will just take the entire calendar and take it as a maintenance schedule. So this is one to one the same as the calendar that I just showed you. But you can also just select uh, multi. And then if you want to just put one of the two events, so you see that here there were two events, this SAP maintenance window and the core server window. If you just want to select one of the two events, then you can do that as well if you select multi. And this is actually the two calendar uh, schedules I created here. And then if you click on the details for those, you are going to see that they just uh, contain the events that you are interested in. The same actually true for the other one. Okay, then there's one additional thing that you can do. Um, if you, for instance, just jump to the, the user preferences here, right in the corner, um, then you can, it also supports already changing the languages. So let's instance, I guess, not many of us will be able to read the, the simplified Chinese if I'm going to select that, but let's just make the change and switch to Chinese. Switch back to the other tab and do a quick reload. And if you then have a look at the calendar, you will see that it's actually translated with one exception, this today button, but it's simply to the reason that this one hasn't been translated by our translators yet. As soon as that string is available into Chinese, it will be shown here in Chinese as well. So, okay, let's quickly go back. Oh, there's one more thing that I want to show you, which is actually, I actually want to have you a quick note of the time here. It says like 8 a.m. where this window is starting. And then you also have, in, again, in the user preferences, the opportunity to select the, the user preferred time zone. Right now, this is sent to Central Europe where I'm living. But we can also just select something else that says like Australia, for instance, and then save the preferences again. Then you should see that this event is, as soon as I reload, will switch from 8 a.m. to whatever we have in Australia right now, which is yeah 2, 2 p.m. apparently. So it also supports um, the shifting of the time zone and the user preferences. One last thing, maybe you might wonder if I scroll back something. Some months, then maybe there was, yeah, I think there was some, some date exactly where there are two overlapping windows on a day. So if they have some overlap, then yeah, this is how it's going to be displayed. And also one last thing, maybe that is also um, comes with localization. 
um, now you notice that, um, that, that, the, that the week actually starts on Sunday um, because this is US English and the default for that language is the week starting on Sunday. But if I select a language where I know that the week should start on Monday, like Spanish, then okay, now I actually didn't switch the tab, so I need to, to find it here again. Maintenance windows, select the schedules again, and then we should see that. And Julio, I think, can confirm that that this is now Monday. Also, the events have moved to Monday. Um, yeah, that's yeah. right. So it will adapt based on the on the local that that you choose. And yeah, that that's actually it for my presentation already. Do you have any questions about that? Or well, let me quickly have a look in the chat as well, maybe. Okay. Um, okay, there was some question about the automation of the calendar, uh, run a cell state or install updates in in a maintenance window. Um, I'm not exactly that, sure what you mean. That, that should already happen. Yeah, exactly. You can unmute yourself. I think, I mean, if you assign, uh, if you set a system to auto update, and then you set a maintenance window, those auto updates will happen when the maintenance window arrives. So I'm not sure if you mean something else. Ah, yeah, great. Didn't, didn't know that. Yeah, we, we probably need to, to explain that somewhere. But yes, it's it's already possible. Yeah, I, I only read it. I, I think it was introduced in the last release, and I found no more details in the documentation. Therefore, I didn't know that it's already implemented. Let's Great. Let me see if I can get this working real quick. No promises yeah. though. I select some system and then there should be a way to assign. Yeah, I edit this, these properties, edit the system properties, and then you have yeah. auto patch update, set it to yes. Exactly, then there's the maintenance schedule, yeah. Ah, brilliant. Yeah, but you, you need to click also to check the, the box above that, auto patch update. Yeah, okay. yeah. Right. exactly, and then. So, and if I then assign the schedule to that system, then you can only show, uh, schedule actions within those maintenance windows. So, if you select some action like scheduling the high state, then you are presented with some of the maintenance windows, and you need to uh, that you want to choose, and then uh, the action is going to be performed within that maintenance window. Great, brilliant. Then forgot what I wrote down in the chat. <laughs> okay, great. Are there some other questions? I have a question. How many of you would like to, uh, so currently the way maintenance windows work is you define them in an external system. So it could be Outlook, it could be Google Calendar, or more usually an ITSM tool. How many people does have a use to create actually the maintenance windows from inside the unique web UI yeah, instead of using an external calendar? I think it's pretty useful. So when now that you have a calendar, it would be it would be a natural thing to just do it now. Of course, done. Uh, this will be implemented first by writing the cal manually. Of course, I, I was just joking. No, we will create it with the UI. Of course. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Can you yeah. do um, uh, salt remote commands uh, with when there's a maintenance schedule set? If it's outside that maintenance window, I, I think, think it, uh, they will not be uh, run. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's what I, would I, I that's what I thought. I just wanted to confirm. Yeah, so making the list of actions that are allowed in a maintenance window configurable is something that yeah we have discussed several times i think already um yeah seems useful although it will be even more useful if we allow multiple maintenance windows and then you can define different actions that are allowed depending on, on what maintenance window you're in yeah and that uh, makes the thing a bit more complicated but yeah it's two steps two independent steps in the end but the solid remote commands are not actually scheduled as actions Rather, they are executed in real time. Maybe you can try. If you go to salt in the menu and um, below oh, that. You want me to try? Yeah, just yes. type REM <laughs> in the search page. Okay. And remote commands. Here. The second. Yeah, remote entry. commands. Yep. 
Okay. And in the asterisk, replace that with your target system there. That one here. Okay. Yeah. What do I need to to type there? The system ID or yeah, oh, the just ID. just the main and, and then start look start for a yeah. for a system that has a maintenance window that is okay. not uh, that is not just a star. Yes. Just a star. Okay. And then yeah. Oh, and then you need to that oh, are dead, it. right? Okay. Yeah, but now you need to find a system that has a maintenance window assigned, and now at this time it's outside the maintenance window. Right. Oh yeah, it only shows the three tar the systems that aren't in that maintenance window. It's not showing your other one. Right, and that's what I found yeah, when true. I first come yeah. across this. Um, yeah. I had systems that were missing, and I couldn't understand why until I realized because they had the maintenance, maintenance windows. Yeah. Okay, so that works already. Right. It, it's working as expected. And working <laughs> as designed, whether or not you like it or not, is <laughs> different. It's, 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 it's kind of unsettling at times when you go here and then you don't see a system that you're expecting to see that you know is working and it's just not there because there's a maintenance window set. Does this also apply to the salt CLI utility? So, for example, if I run salt and then the name of a salt minion that's actually part of a maintenance window and then maybe something like cmd run would it be executed or not it should be i think because uh, it should, yeah. the, the, I, this I is think... managed at the system manager level uh, the uni level not at the salt level yeah, okay you can always execute salt commands so even if in a maintenance window Okay, because that would be great to add it in the documentation as as well, uh, because you already mentioned that you want to um, append the list of comments that are actually available when a host is in maintenance window mode. Because I think maybe some users don't don't know that and run the comment, and then they are they are like, oh, I didn't know that it would be executed. With well, let me check what I, I think. I think the list of actions is already in the. Yes, it's in the documentation, right? If I remember would, correctly, would those CLI salt commands be captured in the events section of that minion? Mm, no. Okay. No, because they are running outside to the outside. I keep saying to the outside the unit. So it it means when you click in, into the details of a minion, there as well you can't run a command, right? When, you, when you pick up a system in systems, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me quickly do that. So it and depends on the actions that actions. you want to run. Yeah. So there are some actions that are actually allowed during the maintenance window. I think one of them is package update. Um, but most of the action yeah. are actually prohibited during the maintenance window. Uh, I pasted, I just pasted the, the link in the chat with the list of. Uh, when you now click on the remote command tab. Yep. What is seen there, then? Um, the same thing, actually. So this is actually only able, you are only able to schedule that during a maintenance window. So if this, if this maintenance window radio button appears there, then you okay. will only be able to do it. Would it make sense to, to define an exclusion here? For example, what do you mean? I mean, for example, you want to look up something on a system. <laughs> Very quickly. For example, I don't know, a directory listing, something like that. And you can't do it in the current state because this machine has a maintenance window assigned, right? But sometimes mm -hmm. you, you just want to do simple things, for example, a directory listing, or I don't know, want to get some information about an RPM package. Maybe we should give the customers the chance to to have an exclusion here. That's probably the emergency mode that we discussed. Oh, yeah. Right. So the, the problem with, with this is uh, an action that uh, so running a command, for instance, might seem uh, safe. And then when you try to unpack a huge RPM, then you bring the performance of the system down, for instance. That happened. So that's why we are not allowing any of that in a in a maintenance yeah, but, window. But what you can always do is that you just detach the uh, the system from the maintenance uh, schedule temporarily, yeah, exactly. and you view direction, and then you you just assign it back. Yeah, but but what if you think bigger? Um, th 
imagine you have a group that contains uh, SLE 50 nodes and you want to, to see some, some special things on, the, on that machine and you want to, to run a command on that group. Then you can, you can run command on a group? Yes, you should. Isn't that possible? I think yes, when you pick up a group, I probably system. don't have any any groups defined here right now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I'm I'm not sure about that. Um, you can try SSM. It should be the same as groups. That's actually true. Let me see. We should have remote commands there, right? But we don't. Yeah. Do you have okay, it under it's under MISC? Um, under MISC. Oh, yeah. Under, under MISC. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, we do. All right. Okay. Nice. I, I know it, it makes absolutely sense. When, when you attach a, a maintenance window to a machine, then you, you want to guarantee that, that uh, nothing should be run out of the maintenance window. But you know, <laughs> uh, sysadmins, uh, they are always busy and have sometimes to do special things on a couple of machines. And when they are in a hurry, that would make sense to, to allow it. But again, can't you just use the maintenance windows in here in SSM to uh, to temporarily detach from uh, from a group of, of systems? Then it would be basically a yeah, single operation again. Yeah, if it's an easy way, sure. If that, oh, yeah. that's an alternative, yeah. Pascal, sure. could you just click the uh, the maintenance windows? I'm, I'm I really well. It's been some time since I yeah. Uh, I mean the, the no um the sub tab maintenance windows. Ah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, now, <laughs> yeah, back to, to MISC, right? And then, yeah, there it's you go. Been some time, it's been some time since uh, since I've seen these. Uh, okay, so yeah, one so of them is already assigned, so I need to assign all, I guess, right? And then, yeah, no, I think we can only assign them to maintenance. Ah, okay. you not retract it from the UI. The, you, you can, there was the first option is none. Ah, none, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's right, right. Okay, so this way you can unassign. Yeah, them. but, uh, but I, I see Umit's uh, point. And it makes sense, especially if we if we couple this with configurable actions, saying for this maintenance we know these actions will be allowed, for these other maintenance we know these other actions or, or restricted, for these other maintenance we know these other yeah. It makes fan sense. It says we are not there yet. Yeah. Would would CVE scans be a restricted or non-restricted action? Anything that may have an impact on the system just on the performance of the system should be restricted in my opinion by default because otherwise you may bring the system to its knees and not be able to to perform i mean will you run okay. a cv scan okay. or a um, open scat okay. scan on a running sap system for instance <laughs> it, uh, and then risk that that I mean, it, makes the system slow it shouldn't bring the machine down yeah, it shouldn't. That's that's it. Should that's that's a key point. So we we all know the theory, but the reality is sometimes, yeah. and that's why we made it I, so strict. I just know that the CVE scans are oftentimes an ad hoc request from Infosec. Um, mm -hmm. We need to find out how many systems are vulnerable to this patch that just came out today, and it's outside the maintenance window. But we need the mm -hmm. answer today, kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, or or we document. It's that we say, hey, okay, when a machine is in a win maintenance windows, you cannot run any user-defined commands, but mm. you can use the, the CLI if you want to yeah. do it. So actually the way it works now and, and checking the list of restricted actions and CV scans should not be restricted. So they, they are in the in the list that of allowed action. So um, what's restricted is package yeah. operations, patch update, mm -hmm. rebooting, rollback. Silence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But very okay. good feedback on this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anything else? Thank you for for bringing this feature. It was asked from from several customers. Really good. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. In this case, 
I guess I will stop sharing and we can move on with the next presentation. I guess that will be me, right? Yes, that's right, but not sure if you are already okay. Here goes. Yes, I hope yeah. it's the right window. It's, um, yeah, so we can good. see the browser now. It looks good. Okay, so yeah, um, my topic is um, where do my states come from? So this is one of the um, most asked um, features over the last year. So as you know, in Uyuni, there's so many different places that um, Uyuni attaches some state to a system. So it could be via configuration channels, it could be via formulas, it could be some internal states we run to make to get get it to run um, inside of Uyuni. So there are so many places that we can assign some state to 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 a to a minion. And uh, most of the times the problem is when they when, when users look at the high state, uh, the code of the high state, and they see some state and they have no idea where is this edit from, why is it there, um, or how to remove it, edit, modify it, or whatever. So um, yeah, for that thing, we just added a small um, table here under states, high state. So this today, I wanted to show you this. So if you can see the state summary for my minion here so this is replace this has replaced the actual um high state output which is not pretty friendly to human eyes so this is a list of all the states um including config channels formulas or internal states by by, by uni it's a list of all um and as you know also there are many ways to assign for example a config channel to a system it could be directly assigned it could be by a system group or it could be um assigned directly to the whole organization so this also in the final column we have the information about okay where this is assigned from um this is um in my deployment now you can i cannot um sort these columns but in in, in the final future it's already there so this is sortable by columns and everything so if you need the also the actual high state output we hit it here under under this link so when you click it you can still see the compiled full high state output here which is returned from the minion um actually that's it yeah that that's how one of the features that we introduced to help with um configuration channels and state management um there's another thing that's a um, small improvement about assigning configuration channels so before i skip uh, skip to that one do we have any questions about this table no but it's brilliant because i have been waiting for this <laughs> thank yeah, you so okay, much for doing that it yeah, was one of the most awesome. requested things okay so um yeah second part of the thing is um so here this is an older deployment so the second feature is not here which is good because i want to show the before and after of the thing so here when i go to configuration channels so um, in this page, this is used to assign a, a config channel or a state channel to a system. The, the same page exists also for SSM on system groups, but it looks the same. And th th this page, to me personally, looks a hell lot confusing. So there's three types here, like search, changes, system. If you know how it works, that's awesome. But if you don't know, um, you should play around a bit in frustration to to find out what's what's going on in this page so what we did is we squashed all these sub tabs here into a single page and now it's a lot sim simpler to use this feature so i will switch to my other server now um so here it's the same page but as you can see there are no more tabs here so everything is in the same 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 page so assignment searching and your changes or whatever so like i don't know let's write something okay so i can filter like this i can assign like this 
when I assign some channels, um, when I make some changes, um, you can see the right top right button changed to save changes. So when I click save changes, I see the usual ordering um, screen. And then when I confirm, my changes are saved. And now um, the right top right buttons have changed to reorder, which goes to the reordering uh, page again. And then we have the button called execute states. This is also different, um, named differently because um, we used to say apply here, which is also confusing. Some people think, okay, is does it is it going to apply my, just my changes and save it, or is it going to apply the states? So we, to make it clear, we just said execute states. Now it's pretty clear that it will run the states on this on the systems. And yeah, this was the second part of it all. Um, yeah, I can take some questions about any of these two things I just mentioned. No question, but uh, it's also a very good improvement in my opinion because it was pretty hard to explain that to the customer how to actually select the configurations all the channels and it's much easier with that uh, new workflow in my opinion. So did a good job. That looks awesome. Thank you. Yeah, very good. The next thing should be figuring out how to create a state because that's kind of convoluted right now too. But this is really good work. Thanks, Don. How long did we ask for that, Don? <laughs> well, I don't know, at least since the release of 4.1 maybe. Ah, <laughs> oh, maybe, I believe, even in 3.1 already. It's been a long time. <laughs> Years. Excellent yeah. work, Jan, thank you. <laughs> yes, bravo, thank you very much. Take it off the board of torture. <laughs> Yoo -hoo! At least one thing gone. So yeah, if no other comments or questions, that's all for me. Thank you all. And yeah, we can move on to the next one, I guess. When will these things be implemented in the next release of Uyuni? Or do you have any wrong um, timeline? These are, these are already merged to, mm -hmm. to the main branch. So I, I'm not even sure if we already have it in the last release but definitely they're 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 going to be in the next one yeah it's going to be part of 202105 okay great good to know i was just curious because in the um left corner it's at uh, 4.20 beta 1 so that was the code base of SUSE manager i think exactly yeah <laughs> because there will be a release 4.2 soon i assume yes at the end of june actually ah, great and the beta program will be open for SUSE manager next week great but yeah so it's um but so sometimes you cannot trust what you see here with the version that you see because it's development systems yeah so for instance that my, my system where i am developing windows support for for, for client for windows clients Mm -hmm. It probably says we well, need 2021 01 or something like that or 02. Yes, yeah. my, my machine looks nothing like the, the the real thing. It's all yeah, the, yeah. ad hoc with patches and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay, what else? Okay, then the next one is uh, Frankie. Right, with the redirected patches. All right, so I hope that you can hear me and you can see my screen. Yes. Yeah, so um, yeah, this is um, going to be hopefully a short one. Uh, and um, it's, uh, uh, it's about redirected patches, as, as, you, can, uh, as you can see from the slides. Um, at the beginning, I would like to really uh, very quickly recap, uh, re recap uh, the, the, um, the um, retroactive patches um, as a whole, uh, and then um, I would like to add to um, to this uh, some some new facts that uh, that weren't um, known last time or some new features. So, just uh, to very very quickly recap. Um, Let's take a look at the uh, at the retracted patch. So it's a it's a patch that that's been released by vendor, for instance, a CC, 
and then was taken back because of some uh, security issue or it could cause some harm on uh, customer customer um, or user uh, user system. So uh, in the typical scenario, um, the patch A is released, then uh, some, sometimes the, the problem is discovered and then the vendor retracts the patch and then the patch B, a successor of A is, is released. Um, just uh, to answer this question very quickly, why cannot be, uh, why cannot uh, SCC release the patch immediately? Well, the thing is that uh, that uh, the patch release process take its time because of uh, QA. There is some process behind behind uh, defined behind this, and uh, retracting is uh, almost instant, so it's kind of security or so some kind <laughs> of handbrake for uh, for. Uh, security or uh, other other important issues. So uh, let's skip this one and let's go straight to the new slides. Um, so the status of the uh, retracted patches is that uh, the, we implemented the first round of web UI and XML RPC parts. Uh, we are a little bit behind with the documentation, but things are moving. Uh, there are two pull requests pending and they are on a good way to be to be merged. So the documentation in Uyuni should be also up to date. And today I would like to focus on this um, kind of invisible uh, invisible uh, um, topic or problem. Um, uh, and this is uh, how the redirected status of a patch is propagated into your organization in Uyuni. And also how patches are shared uh, in, in Uyuni, because uh, this is also very, very important. Um, if you if you want to understand how the how the retracted patches um, work and how they are uh, they are visible to the systems, so firstly, um, let's take a look at the retracted patches. How the retracted status is propagated in your organization in case you are using vendor channels directly by your clients. This is a, the the easiest um, um, scenario. So let, that's why that's why we start with it. So let's say. Um, uh, yeah, if, if a vendor uh, retracts a, a patch, then um, then your clients see this uh, this fact uh, that the status of, uh, of of the patch has changed to retracted. They see it um, instantly uh, when when the when your reposing uh, reposing finishes. So let's take a look at this example. I think that it it uh, tells um, maybe it's more descriptive. Um, so uh, let's say that you are using a patch, uh, a channel which is called or which has labels Lee 15 SP3 updates. So it's kind of simplification here, but I hope that you forgive me. Um, and then um, SCC returns a patch in in this in this channel. Um, you have a system that is uh, subscribed to this channel. Um, then reposing typically once per night uh, synchronizes this patch. Then the repo data or the repo, uh, repository metadata is regenerated for the for the channel, and then the client will immediately see the package as retracted. So if you do, do zipper release patches, you will see this patch as retracted. So that's um, very simple. Uh, I think that it makes uh, makes a lot of sense. But uh, what happens if you are using clones? Um, and I think that typically uh, people or users of Uyuni uh, use clone channels. They don't use vendor channels directly to their systems, but they use some um, kind of uh, cloning, like for instance, uh, content lifecycle management. Well, in this case, uh, when whenever a vendor retracts a, a patch from the from the channel, then the patch is not really propagated automatically, or the patch status is not propagated automatically to, to the clones. So let's again take a look at the example similar as the last one, but now you don't have your system uh, subscribed directly to the uh, to the vendor channel, but you have a clone channel instead. Um, well, once again in the night, Reposing happily synchronizes the retracted patch in the in the vendor channel, but the clone channel is unchanged. It still observes the the clone patch because the clone uh, the, the patch has been cloned, but it's it's it hasn't been updated automatically. Because it's a different object, so the client still sees this as a as a stable or a final. Mm -hmm. So what what you what you can do is that you can just um, synchronize the patch manually. Uh, using the using the patch sync, or you can use the content lifecycle management. And uh, on the on the next build of your project, when you use the vendor channel as a as a source, then the uh, the patch uh, status will be propagated to the clones. Uh, so yeah, CLM does it by default automatically. You can turn it off. Uh, yeah, we will speak about this later. Um, so this is uh, this can already be 
a bit confusing, but wait for it. Uh, it's, it gets even more confusing because how Uyuni uh, handles the clone patches is, is also a, a different story because we don't really have, um, we, we don't really create clone patches for uh, for each um, each clone of the vendor channel in your organization. But instead of that, uh, Uyuni typically creates only a single patch that is then shared between all clones of the channel in your organization. Um, yeah, well, the question is, uh, is if the users are aware of this, um, maybe some portion of the users is not even aware of that. Well, um, what's um, not so nice consequence is that if we propagate the retracted status to your clone channel in your organization, um, it affects the, uh, the patch and it affects all the channels that, uh, that make use of this patch, that share this patch. On this uh, on this graph, you can see how how it um, how it looks like. So this is not very uh, not very um, let's say uh, dramatic. Let's just go to to more to more um, complex example with content lifecycle management. So let's imagine that you have two content lifecycle management projects in your organization, and they use the same source vendor channels. Um, you have uh, as you can see here, two projects. Each project has um, has two environments, dev and test. And um, in this uh, in this example, you can see that the um, the channels use the clone clone patch in your organization, and all of these four channels share the same clone patch object. That means whenever a vendor retracts a patch and you propagate the change to the cloned patch. For instance, you build project one. It means that all the um, all the channels that uh, that um, observe or that, that use this patch are affected by it. So they will see it as a retracted because simply this this patch object is shared between all the channels in your organization. Um, as a consequence, um, the clients that are uh, that are uh, subscribed to um, let's say to the second uh, channel in the second project. Um, they will observe the, uh, the patch retraction, no matter if you did build and promote um, in your in your project. They just they will just see it as soon as you modify the clone patch. So this is not so nice consequence of the of uh, of the patch sharing. But um, as you will see later, uh, this is uh, this is how Uyuni uh, Uyuni handles handles the the cl uh, clone channels and um, uh, how how it shares the patches. So this could be a little bit unexpected for the user. Uh, there could be two solutions to this. Um, in the end, uh, we decided to go with the with this solution with this first proposal. That means the uh, patch propagation attributes uh, should be more visible for the user. And for instance, in the uh, content lifecycle management UI, now whenever uh, this situation happens, that means whenever there is a retracted patch in the source channel that is not in the um, in the in, in the target channel, you should see a big message in a uh, content lifecycle management before you build that you are affecting basically all channels in your organizations with uh, with this uh, retracted patch. So all the channels will observe this uh, this retraction. Um, yeah, um, second solution could be to create a um, clone patch per channel. That means whenever you clone a channel, whenever you, uh, let's say, create a new content lifecycle management project, um, you don't only clone the channel, but you also clone the patches one by one. So you, with each clone, which each, uh, with each uh, channel clone, you create, um, you, you clone all the patches, um, as, as, as new objects, uh, but unfortunately, this uh, I, I think that there is uh, there is a reason why um, why uh, the patches are shared in Uyuni, and this is because of the uh, patch explosion. If you imagine you have uh, you have a very big Slee channel that has thousands of uh, patches, and then you have uh, ten content lifecycle management projects, each with three environments, uh, things can get exploded pretty quickly. So that's why uh, that's why this is this it's there. So. Um, if I scared you a lot, um, yeah, I, I would like to I would like to um, um, calm you a little bit because uh, even though this uh, retracting affects all the all the channels in your organization, if you if you just propagate to a, a single channel, um, this shouldn't really happen very often. Uh, so this is this is really a feature that should that should kick in only 
I don't know, like once a year, um, and uh, only for one one patch because retracting it's really something that uh, that um, that really didn't happen so so often in, in the past. So you shouldn't be really really scared that something goes wrong. And even even I think that it's a good thing if you propagate um, on the, this retraction of the of the patch because um, in the end um, I think that uh, that users really want to uh, to um, observe their or. or they they really want their computers or their, or their systems to observe this uh, uh, retracted patches because well they were retracted for a reason uh, usually the reason is very good so um, SEC doesn't want uh, users to install this patch because it, it can really cause some harm so uh, that was that was basically it sorry for a little bit more boring uh, presentation than the the previous. Um, um, Great presentations, but yeah, I think that it, it, it it's fair to to mention uh, mention this behavior because maybe you can uh, you can hit it in the in the future. Um, well, and if you have if you have any questions, just uh, just um, ask now, or you can uh, ping me anytime, uh, or ju just write me an e email. I think that yeah, contact information is is here. So um, yeah, um, that was everything from my side. If you have anything uh, you would like to ask, just yeah. Just throw it at me. <laughs> yeah, I think what, there's two things. Frankly, I, I don't know if you mentioned that. One is uh, the fact that a patch is retracted doesn't mean that is it is installed on the system. So nothing is uninstalled from a running system. Yeah, just uh, automatically. It, it's a retracted in metadata. It's retracted in the channel. But if you if no one installs any software, then Nothing is uninstalled. The system is not notified because I think that was Neil's uh, main worry when, when we first mentioned retracted patches a few months ago. And then the other thing is, why did we choose this strategy of propagating the patches, the retracted patches automatically to protect the users? Because a retracted patch means so when 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 a vendor, and in this case, SUSE is the only vendor supporting this retracted patches has decided that they need to immediately retract something like in minutes from the from uh, SUSE since SUSE knows this instead of waiting one or two days until a new uh, patch an updated patch uh, uh, is is available it means that the potential consequences of installing this patch are terrible uh, very bad so mm -hmm. that's why we prefer to protect the user even if it's a, a, a totally unexpected behavior that a retracted patch automatically goes into the channels, into the cloned channels. Yeah, I mean, you still need to, uh, you still need to um, propagate it to to the first yeah. uh, first channel. I mean, by building either building the content lifecycle management project right. or to the do the, the, the patch sync. Uh, there is, by the way, there is an XML RPC endpoint, or there are two That's XML right. RPC That's endpoints right. for that. Yeah. So you can you can also do it. By XML RPC, you can you can scan, for instance, your channels um, if they have unsynced patches or if they need uh, if they have um, patches needed synchronization, and then you yeah so you, so you can you can like scan Uni for for affected patches that are that have um, a retracted patch. Sorry, uh, you, you can you can uh, get a list of channels or you can scan your channels to see if uh, the clone channel. Has some uh, retracted patch in the original that needs synchronization. <laughs> Sorry uh, if, if it's a little bit confusing. But yeah, I think that it's. It, yeah, it's, that's it's something that Simon is saying that this broke the CentOS Rata import uh, speed by Steve Meyer. That's completely true. <laughs> and but that, since that's a third-party tool, we didn't really think of, of that. So uh, Steve is already aware of this and. Yesterday we cleared how we put information on how to fix the script, so I, I think it will be fixed very soon. Actually, this was a, this was a change that um, uh, um, that uh, isn't really directly uh, connected, or it's not because of retracted patches. It's because of some change that got to the uh, to the code alongside uh, with 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 this pull request. Um, mm. So, but it sh it shouldn't happen. I mean, we should we should have at least bumped the. Uh, external RPC version. Hmm. And is there also some kind of reporting functionality that would show when a retracted patch was installed on some of the hmm. machines you're running? That's yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, the question. Thanks for that. Um, so if you have uh, your uh, if you have already a retracted 
uh, patch applies to your system and you go to the system and you go to the list of packages that are installed or list, list of patches that are applied, then you will see an icon. But uh, I, um, I agree that there should be a bigger visibility of this. Like you should see some kind of overview of, uh, of your systems that have a restricted patch uh, installed. But uh, this is yeah this is planned as a second step or second iteration uh, of of the of the feature. So this was just the first one. In the first iteration, we just wanted to make Uni aware of this, so sync it uh, to the repositories, to the channels, and then display it in the UI in case uh, the uh, channel contains retracted package or patch, or a system has installed a package or a patch. But um, yeah, uh, some some more elaborate like, view of uh, or overview in the UI is still missing. But yeah, it, it should come. Um, I think that I think that it's uh, it's in the RFC in uh, some next steps. So it's matter if, uh, if if it gets planned or not. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, and um, with that, the agenda for today is complete, but of course we still have seven minutes in case we want to discuss something else or there are any other questions you want to formulate. I was just wondering, I think I already raised an issue on GitHub about that, um, the content lifecycle management, um, whether they are it will be planned to have the option to downgrade to previous version. Uh, that's also a very, very good question. You mean if you have installed a retracted patch and you want to downgrade the package? Yeah, if you have a version for the content lifecycle project, let's say version 1.0, then 2.0, and then you um, you um, figured out that there's an issue in a patch and you just want mm -hmm. to reassign the old view of a freezed package content. Yeah, the problem is, uh, and uh, this is a deeper problem, uh, this is not, not possible, and I don't really foresee this being possible, uh, because uh, package downgrade um, in general is something that uh, we really cannot guarantee that it's, uh, it's, um, it will be successful. And yeah. uh, the RPMs they have, uh, they have, um, let's say, pre and post scripts in them, and um, doing zipper install old package or like downgrading the package uh, can uh, can lead to some uh, unpredictable results. I mean, you can always uh, uninstall the package and install the older one manually, which is not very user friendly, I agree. But the thing is that there is no guarantee that the downgrade uh, succeeds. So that's why we did not really include this uh, this in the, in, in the feature. I'm not sure if Pau, do you want to say something more to it or? No, that's essentially it, but I think you can force it uh, by a salt state, for instance. You could mm -hmm. say PKG installed and specify some specific version, and it should work. So, yeah, or you I mean, can just use uh, CentOS or Oracle Linux and do yum downgrade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wasn't. Um, thinking about actually really downgrading the package. But for example, you have some dev and some prod systems, and then you figured out that you want to avoid that another administrator accidentally installs a package that you already discovered as faulty. So you could simply just want to have the old view. So you don't want to downgrade actually anything, but you just want to make sure that nobody accidentally installed something. And so you, you want already... to get it? You want the same states. You want some kind of, of reverting back that change. Yeah, right? so I don't know whether you guys know the Foreman and uh, Cartello project. And the, yeah. content, and the content view concept they have, because that's actually exactly what they have. They have a frozen view of um, a set of packages. And it's it's in easier words some some kind of just linking to a set of um, of package states. So it doesn't have anything to do with ac actually downgrading packages, but you have an old view and you don't accidentally can install faulty packages, for example. Yeah, uh, this is essentially what uh, what the um, content lifecycle management environment are. Um, they are. Yeah. I think that these are basically the same thing as Catello or Foreman um, content views, and yeah, I mean, if you if you have always the old packages in your in um, let's say in the in the test environment, like in the in the latest uh, content 
uh, view, uh, so to say, um, then yeah, this this is essentially what you have. So it, it's really frozen there until you until you promote it or until you overwrite it again. So, but, but um, the question is, what if a broken package or patch is already in one of the stages? I think this was the question. What what's what's our way to revert back to a sane state? I think the only chance we have with our tool with with CLM is to to remove a specific patch or package. Right. Um, well, because of this package of patch sharing that uh, that was uh, yeah that was one of the one of the um, well I won't I don't want to say features but one of the facts that I, I presented is that whenever you uh, whenever you um, build your project then all uh, the, the, the and if you have the patch that uh, is going to be retracted and then all the environments are already not, already not, affected. Not only think of of retracting patches. For example, if some sometimes you install a patch that will break only your systems, it does not mean that the vendor would retract the patch. It ah, so you want to, you want to just uh, remove some patch from from the from the. Yes, yes, um, yes. I think the question f from the colleague was I don't know what the name was. Um, can we revert back fastly to a sane channel state? And if yes, how? Uh, yes. The CLM, for well, example. You can, well, the thing is that by doing so, you are uh, kind of defeating the purpose of, of the CLM. But okay, we had this. We had this idea of having um, uh, fast track and exception channels in in CLM. But these, uh, I think that no, this, no, this, this. I think you are thinking too complex. I, I think that currently that the solution would be to 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 build a filter to uh, to deny that specific patch that would break the customer system right yeah you could do that but then you need to promote to all the environments yes yes exactly but but that's that's the only uh, p chance we have with CLM, well, right currently currently you can still touch the, uh, the the channels that are in your environment so you can always manually let's say remove the patch I mean, until the next promote, uh, because then it will get over it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But, you... but the, the 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 colleague was asking for it. He, he said he he wants to prohibit that some other administrator would install that broken patch again. So he wants to prohibit it on a channel level. When I got him correctly. Well, and the, for this you could um, you could use these exceptional channels, but uh, these are not yet implemented. I mean, this is also some mm -hmm. some next steps in the, in the content lifecycle management. So, so the, the way you will do this, Umit uh, and Christian, will be you create a content lifecycle management project. You filter out all the patches and packages mm -hmm. that you don't want anyone to install, and it's then that, that, and, and then wait, 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 <laughs> and Sorry. then you can create a second project where your source channels are the output from the previous one so that you have kind of a baseline mm -hmm. that you are building as the master uh, uni operator master uni uh, sysadmin and then tell to your other people to your puppets you, you tell them you can work with these source channels you cannot use the vendor channels as the as the starting of, of your projects Yes, but I think you, you uh, Christian, you were yeah. already talking about CLM channels, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, definitely. And then yeah. what you can do, what you can do is, is and this, so typically people will have three environments, right? So dev, test, and prod, but you can add a fourth one. I typically call it backup or rollback after production, so that I go when I promote, I promote from dev to test to prod, and then to uh, this rollback, and and then. If I want, uh, if I and the, the channels that I assign to my systems are the production channels, not the latest environment, but the the previous environment in this project, and then if I want to roll back, I reassign uh, the okay. channels to to this to, to this um, uh, final uh, environment, which is a but fake environment. We have to re-articulate it or express it yeah. in another way. Christian, I don't know. Was this answered from your point of view or? Yeah, I, also it, 
I think it it goes in the right direction. So I I now understood that I do not only need uh, to specify the main, let's say, SUSE channels as source, but I can also take an cl all already cloned channel as source and then can use the filters, for example, mm. to exclude some particular patches. And yes. I think there there was also the, the space CMD commit or another CLI tool that can be used to particularly copy patches to already cloned channels. So, for example, if I only want to copy one particular patch, I could do that as well. Yeah, I don't think that they are working with CLM. This okay. is my knowledge. I mean, you it's, could use them. You could use it, but uh, there is still the danger that on the next promote, everything will get uh, aligned again. So. Basically, you would need to do it after after each promote. I mean, in the end, C element channels are are, are just normal clone channels. But um, but uh, but whenever you do build or promote operation, then well, the, the content will get affected. So or all your let's say manual changes would would get uh, would get erased. Yeah, yeah, that's that that's the thing. We have this space CMD uh, copy errata commands, for example. You can use it. I, I when I got you correct with CLM channels, but whenever you promote your channels again, the, the er erratas or the patches would uh, would be gone, right? It should be like that, yeah. So I mean, I wouldn't really encourage using uh, using such a, such a thing. In the end, we should really have this fast track and exceptional channels um, implemented. That would be the best thing, of course. Uh, where um, it, it always uh, depends on 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 uh, what what the users want. It, it's a big, yeah, the, the uh, history big is, for is this or, uh, yeah. Before CLM, many customers were using space CMD commands, for example, yeah. for cloning channels, for adding erratas, etc. But with CLM, you don't have the ability, like in the like we had in the past, right? What Can we run CLM from from command line? Exactly, exactly. You, you can, can actually. Yeah, you can use it by using the API, right? That's yeah, the only yeah, yeah. way. But you don't have any space CMD commands that would achieve it, right? Uh, I'm not sure about space CMD. Uh, well, you can well, always, you can API. always use the API from a space CMD directly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I just wanted to add something is this chaining of CLM projects is also very useful when you are using or filtering out rel 8 modules and app streams. So that's probably something that you want to do. Lots and to lots of layers for that one. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, for now, it's a, the solution is, is that maybe later we will allow to have a multi-stage project. Uh, so several layers of filters in the same project, but at the moment, the solution is to have different uh, projects, one as the input of another. Typically for for uh, for relate case, you will only need two projects. One to deal with the modularity with the upstreams and the other to do the, the actual filtering that you are using with any other operating system that's not in this upstreams mess. Okay. okay, then we are. And we don't have up. Neil on the line to defend yeah. DNF and the modules. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, so oh, we I are can a take bit... over that part. I mean, I'm not going to defend them. So we are a little bit over time, but I think that the discussion was really interesting. I would say that if we don't have any other topics, then maybe we can end the community hours for today. But of course, remember that we can still uh, have conversations at either the uni mailing lists or Gitter. So, Pau, I think you can stop the recording already. Okay, I will make the recording available in the YouTube channel, in the uni YouTube channel that's linked at the bottom of the uni main page, the home page. So, yeah. Thank you very much all for attending and thanks for the input. Yeah, thanks everybody. And thanks. enjoy the weekend, of course. See you soon. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. See you next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.